Welcome to the Guns and Gavel Show, where Arizona's self-defense and firearms attorney, Tim Forshee, weighs in on the delicate balance between the law and personal protection. Learn about the legalities and realities of self-defense as he dives deep to discuss firearms laws, legal use of force, concealed carry, and home defense training. The Guns and Gavel Show starts in three, two, one. So I had a guy in my in my class this past weekend, coincidentally, who was a just retired Secret Service agent, mm. and uh, one of the rare law enforcement people that I have in my class who actually revealed that fact. He didn't do it grandiose. He wasn't inappropriate about it. Really nice guy, very downspoken. But he came up during a break and talked to me, and then I said, would you be willing to mention that to the rest of the class, perhaps? He said, sure. So we had him talk a little bit and stuff. But uh, in the process of talking about that, we talked about the uh, the Secret Service, coincidentally, just about two weeks ago, released their, their National Threat Assessment Center report for, our, I want to say, like 2016 to 2020. Yeah. And they went through and they looked at what they're calling mass attacks, what a lot of people are calling mass shootings or, or mass public shootings, MPS. Mm-hmm. First of all, I think you and I have talked about this before. I absolutely hate that they call them mass shootings. I, I think that just drives me up the wall. Yeah, I mean, listen, you're going to try to find a, a phrase that correlates into these things. Uh-huh. I think um, we use plenty of euphemisms, right? Uh-huh. So I go to the range and shoot a lot all the time. Right. Uh, you know, so when we say somebody went on a shooting spree, that sounds like they went to the store and, right. and bought things. Right. No, it's a killing rampage. Right, exactly. Is Let's, what call, we it have. What Let's call it what it is. And I, I always tell people, you know, I'm, a, I'm an active competitive shooter. I, I shoot uh, IPSC and USPSA mm-hmm. and, and uh, three gun and blah, blah, blah. And I was at a uh, at a mass shooting just a few weekends ago at, at our local shooting range at Rio Salado Sportsman's Club. Yeah. And there were about 200 guys out there shooting a three gun match. And when I say guys, I'm inclusive, of course, sure. including girls, because I'm a jerk. Um, but lots and lots of folks, and I saw smiles and hugs and embraces, and everybody had a great time sure. and laughter, and everybody left, and it was completely safe and very, very courteous. That was a mass shooting, but yet I'm not sure why we've allowed the media and our, even our government to take the term shooting and somehow bastardize it and demonize it. We don't call it a mass driving when somebody drives into a crowd of people and kills them. Right. We don't call it a mass knifing when somebody attacks somebody with a machete. And I just wish you could sort of get that that term back to some degree, I guess. But yeah, I mean, there's terms me. like that's my that, like, you know, assault weapons. And, yeah. And, I mean, you know, no, assault is a behavior, not right. a tool, that's you right. know. Uh, and so I'd prefer we remove that. You know, they're saying now assault-style yeah. rifle. And, and no, an assault rifle has a very particular definition, right. and it's not a style. Uh, it's, I get a good result sometimes when I point out to them where that term came from as you know, and then that, that sort of, maybe then they feel a little bit more sheepish about it. So Yeah, I mean, but, uh, and, and obviously, you know, when who do you give an assault rifle to? An assaulter? And right. who's an assaulter? Is yeah. somebody who's in a military unit <laughs> exactly. whose job is to close with the enemy and right, destroy right, them and kill right. them and break their stuff. You know, that's so, now, job. so now that I've ranted about my, my bias against the term mass shooting, let's go ahead and use the term they use, which was, uh, which was uh, mass attacks, which okay. I guess I like better. So apparently there were about 173 such attacks recorded during that four-year period of time. Now, I think that's probably way low, but let's remember they're defining this as uh, three or more people yep. who are never in the location of any of their residences. So it has to be away from home, yep. three or more people. So anything that happens at home... And I believe three or more people, not the shooter. Correct, not including the shooter. Or That's killed. Correct. So if we talk about, if we, if we throw in attacks that happen in home, mm-hmm. and if we talk about attacks that happen with less than three or four people, I think right. those numbers would, would dramatically, dramatically increase. But let's use their numbers, and let's see if we can gain some, some, some understanding from that. So out of those 173 attacks, they claim that 74% of the attackers had prior criminal records, and I believe that meant felony records from, what I, from the way I read the report. Sure. Uh, 41% of them had a history of domestic violence that was well-documented. So convictions for domestic violence. I don't mean you got in an argument at a party and pushed somebody. I mean you were convicted yeah. of it. Um, 50% had exhibited mental health symptoms, including psychoses and suicidal thoughts. Mm-hmm. And I was just interested, to, I mean, you've probably noticed like I do instantly, what do all those categories have in common? They disqualify you from being a legal owner of a firearm. Sure. So the vast majority of these perpetrators can't legally have guns in the first place. Does that surprise you in the least bit? No. I mean, of course not. Obviously, I think one of the things that we see that the commonalities there is um, is that we knew in advance that there was something wrong, right? right. Obviously, so as a society, we've already removed their right to keep and bear arms right. via due process, and I think due process is a thing. And, and, and of course, it doesn't stop the ones who want to go and do what they're going to do. Um, you know, the deadliest mass attack in American history was done with fertilizer. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second deadliest mass attack in America was done with airplanes. And so, um, you know, it doesn't require a firearm, though the ones that we're worried about on a regular basis involve firearms disproportionately. So, and again, it's almost never 
where where these things happen and and you know the the prototypical well he was such a nice boy and all his neighbors yeah. we never had any problems and it was you know he was always so nice and cut his grass perfectly and right. he always you know helped old ladies across the street. But those are street. always the serial killers it seems right like, right and those that's are, not what we're talking about here we're talking about somebody who has a grandiose suicide plan yeah that's I mean people never talk about that but these these mass murders that happen with guns they're almost always suicidal. And obviously, one form of suicide is homicide, or better, I guess better put, one form of homicide is suicide. Um, if, if only they'd do it in the other order. If they would just do suicide, homicide, it would be a lot better than when they do homicide, suicide. Yeah, you and, notice? and I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm, uh, suicide has touched my family very, very personally, yep. and so I don't joke around about mm-hmm. that. Obviously, um, you know, homicidal urges are, are just as, or even worse in many cases, in these cases especially, than suicidal urges and and the number of suicides in America is a problem that we need to right. deal with and the number of those with firearms is a problem that we need to deal with but obviously you know folks who who we know have violent tendencies that we know have had um, problems that that most of these you know you look at uh, recent ones we can think about in Buffalo in the supermarket and uh, in Illinois at the 4th of July parade mm-hmm. at Uvalde in Texas um, Literally all three of those killers, which I, I have a rule personally. I call it some a hole rule. I never, never mention, them mention by their name. name. Amen. One May they die in ignominy. You. Never mention their name. Um, and and but but all had had you know significant contact with law enforcement. Yep. All had had you know and and the neighbors were like, oh, we knew this was coming. That's just it. That was the other thing that the study revealed was that uh, the vast majority of these uh, involved the use of weapons. The vast majority of them were illegally possessed weapons. Yep. But even more than that everybody's co-workers said, yeah, this guy always had a problem. This guy had all kinds of issues fitting in. He was uh, exhibiting all kinds of symptoms of anger. He'd been evicted. He lost his job. He was having financial strains. There was all these, as they say, red flags. That term has been sort of bastardized in the last five years. But all these red flags are going up, and everybody just basically just kept, you know, just kept on keeping on. And uh, if there's a moral to this story, I guess it would be, for me at least, is if there's someone in your life, at your place of work, at your school, and they just make the hair stand up on the back of your head, Pay attention to that. Listen to that. You yeah, know? and I think the it's so the thing that we see is is that in my opinion, the vast majority of the time we actually do intervene. You know, we, mm-hmm. we but we don't hear about those. They don't make the national news. That's true. You're right. The number you're of right. times that the cops go and catch that guy yeah. and okay, no, we're we're gonna go do a 72 hour hold and then right. no, we're gonna get you some help and we're gonna get the social services here so that this doesn't happen. That's the vast majority. Yeah. And it doesn't make the news. That's true. When they slip through the cracks, that's when it does. And, and of it's course just like all with, with all self defense. I mean you don't hear about the yeah. the ten thousand times last year that the private privately owned CCW holders uh, drew their weapon legally and threatened to use force and stopped the yeah. incident. There's no bloodshed. Well, that's not newsworthy. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't, make doesn't make the news. It doesn't make the news. You never hear about those. Right. That's right, yeah. It, but, well, they say that in over 90% of defensive gun uses do not involve the discharge of the firearm. Firearm's not fired. That's right. That's, that's a clue. And, and 90% of the ones where it is fired with handguns, it's not fatal. Right. And again, somebody's wounded with a handgun in New York City. That doesn't make the news. It doesn't make the news. So that means literally you're down to 1% yeah. that might make the news, yeah. And, and I think that we can all agree that, that given the these commonalities that we see, you know, that we knew prohibited possessor on the, the um, radar of law enforcement. Mm-hmm. We, we know we've had problems before that, that we start saying, wait a minute, there are commonalities here. And I think that they speak to kind of some of the social structure of America today yes. that, that we say, well, we just got to, you know, ban guns or whatever. Good luck on inventing the firearm. It's just right. not going to happen. Right. But, but to look and say, okay, wait a minute, how do we increase our access to social services? Mm-hmm. As somebody who fights for uh, some beloved family and their access to mental health care services, yeah. I can tell you it is... It's difficult. No, difficult is not the yeah. word. It, it is impossible. Yeah. And, and uh, to the place of, I mean, many nights of tears of fighting against the bureaucracy. Correct me, but I think that I, the, stat, the statistic that I've seen is that there are uh, like only 10% of the beds that are available today that were available 30 years ago, despite the fact that the that the need for those beds has quadrupled. Oh yeah, I mean that sound about right. Uh, the the chances of uh, let's just say you had an acute inpatient uh, need for suicide or homicidal mm-hmm. ideologies. Um, I I have literally sat with a loved one in the emergency room for five full days waiting for a bed to come. Oh over. my gosh, F- five full days. Wow. Uh, waiting for one bed anywhere within a hundred right. mile radius to come open. So, um, and and of course for most, if you're an adult, right you. You're not on a hold at five days. The most right. you can do is 72 hours. Right, 72, 72 hours. 
I'm going to check myself out of this, yeah. this and, joint. And you, those of you that know about mental health, and John's far more of an expert than I am, but I've, I've dealt with several cases that involve this. It oftentimes takes mental health professionals a year, two years, four years to get your medications, the proper medications and the proper dosages. I mean, yeah, I mean we don't be able to figure that out in three days. We don't understand perfectly how mm -hmm. uh, the, the you know, uh, chemical system of the brain works. Mm -hmm. And so they call it a medical practice for a reason. Yeah, and, exactly. and every individual is so different. You know, you throw a dart and hope, uh, well, this particular medication helps a lot of people with these problems. Yeah. We'll let it go for a month. Right. You know, we'll come back and talk to me in a week. We'll see how it's going. Another week, another week. Eh, it's not doing very good. Well, let's try something else. Okay, well, that's not doing so great. Right. That's causing another side effect. So let's try this thing instead. And it's a hit and miss, try it's and trial and error. Trial and the and error, error can be quite... Unfortunately, horrible. Yeah, yeah and exactly. unfortunately, especially in adolescence, right? Um, so, so many of these that are perpetrated by, you know, say under 25s, your brain chemistry mm -hmm. and your, your frontal cortex isn't fully developed until you're 25 right. years old. And adolescent brain chemistry is even less uh, understood. And one of the big things when you're loading, especially loading uh, the categories of, say, like SSRIs and those. Now, listen, I'm, I'm neither a psychiatrist nor a psychologist. I'm not a pharmacist. I'm just somebody who has... But you stayed at a Holiday Inn Express. Well, and I, I, this is something my family and I have dealt with right. a lot. Okay, so I have, I, I, I have beyond a hobbyist level of right. interest here. Right. Okay, so I, I'm an expert in the end user side. Mm -hmm. um, that, that one of the things when you're loading, a, especially in the SSRI lines, in teens especially, is impulse control. Yeah. And uh, that impulsivity, they can just cycle so fast. Now, once they're loaded, that tends to, to decrease significantly, right. but it can be very dangerous time. Right. And um, that's, of course, we're talking about impulsive, yeah. homicidal, yeah. suicidal acts. Yeah. And so many of these folks that commit these mass attacks, right, these mass killings, um, they have been on the radar. And so they were receiving mental health right. services. But then they, what we find almost universally is the... the it's past tense. They were receiving mental health services. Yeah. So they're not on their medications anymore. And, and so some, in, especially in the self-defense community, they blame the medications mm -hmm. when the reality is the medication for however long they were taking it really helped. A lot of people that are mentally ill will say, well, I, they, there were side effects. I didn't like the side effects. I was doing better, so right. I just went off the meds. Well, very common. What do you think is going to happen? Very, yeah, I mean, invariably, right? People go through that, it seems. So, yeah, yeah, very common. Yeah. And, and so uh, I really think that that an overhaul of the mental health care system in America, and, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a whole bunch of money and a willingness right. to do that. Uh, but deinstitutionalization that started in the 1970s yeah. in America, there's, it's like you said, I mean... The pendulum has swung too far. Well, t today, you want to get into a psychiatrist. You know, hey, man, right. we need some help. We need some chemical help here because we have a real significant right. acute problem. Uh, you're here in the Valley where, where we live. You're probably talking anywhere from a five to eight week lead time for the first appointment. It's an eternity if you're in anguish. And, yeah. and now, okay, if you have uh, health insurance, okay, those will usually be covered. A psychiatrist appointment will because yeah. they're a doctor, but most times the counseling that needs to go with it won't. And uh, so a counselor, if you're like, okay, I wanna get in and see a counselor, that's smart and good. Most insurance isn't gonna cover a lot of that. When they do, um, it will be for a very limited time. If they don't, most of those counselors, you're talking 100 to $150 a session. Right. And if you're doing that weekly, so now you're saying, okay, we want you to, to put five to $800 in your budget for that, which for most Americans in a time of vast economic uncertainty is, it's just not tenable. Not to mention a lot of the people that are fighting those mental illnesses that need the help are probably unemployed or unemployed. Underemployed. Right now. So how are yeah. they supposed to do that? Yeah. yeah. It's just a hor it, we need to, it, it's got to be about resource allocation. And it seems like we just keep focusing on the items. You know, let's, let's ban these so-called assault weapons. Yeah. Let's ban high capacity magazines. Let, let's ban, uh, you know, braces that are on guns, et cetera, et cetera. It's, there, there's so much focus on that. I just haven't seen anything like that <clears throat> affect the crime rate in my lifetime. It just doesn't work. So... I just don't understand how many times people have to fail at that before you realize we've got to reallocate our, our thought process and our, and our resources here. Yeah. I don't know, hopefully well, and, and, and find some things that we can, we can do together. And that wraps up another episode of Guns and Gavels. Join us next time to learn more about the legal use of force, personal protection, and firearms training. Show your support and hit the like and subscribe buttons to make sure you never miss an episode. Till next time, stay safe.